Hello, my name is Paul Burston. I'm the author of six novels and I am the curator and the host of Polari Literary Salon, which was due to appear at Huddersfield Lit Fest this week. Unfortunately, we, we shan't be there due to the coronavirus, so I decided to give you a little taste of Polari from my home. Um, I don't normally sit at home dressed like this, this is just me getting into the spirit of things. And also, this is my motto in life. Stick to this if you can, folks. Um, I'm going to give you a short reading from my latest novel. It's called The Closer I Get, and it's a psychological thriller about a writer and his stalker. Here goes. This is The Closer I Get, and this is Chapter One, Day One. It was great seeing you today. You probably don't believe me, not after everything that's happened, but it's the truth. I'd never lie to you, Tom. I never have, not once. I'm not like all the others. We live in an age of such deceit, don't we? People lie all the time. It's second nature to them. Everyone is so afraid of appearing stupid or saying the wrong thing and offending someone. Everyone's so keen to make a good impression. Virtue signaling, boasting about their perfect lives on Facebook, posting artfully posed selfies and filtered photos of their dinner on Instagram. Social media has made lies of us all. But not me. If anything, I'm too honest for my own good. Maybe if I'd learned to hold my tongue more, we wouldn't be in this mess, but then I wouldn't have been true to myself. I can't change the way I am, Tom, even for you, even if there's a price to pay. You used to admire my honesty. Refreshing, you said. A free thinker, you said. Did you change your mind? Were you humouring me when you said those things? I'd hate to think that you lied to me from the outset. That would make you a hypocrite, my darling. I probably shouldn't be telling you this. I probably shouldn't be writing to you at all. But before we go any further and our words are twisted and taken out of context, I want to make one thing clear. I don't blame you. Honestly. I don't think you knew what you were getting yourself into. I don't think either of us did. Maybe if we had, we'd have done things differently. But life's not like that. You don't wake up one morning knowing that today is the day you'll meet the person who's going to change your life forever. You don't go into these things with your eyes wide open. They just sort of creep up on you. And that's how it was with us. We don't decide when we fall in love. We don't choose it. It chooses us. We have no more control over it than we do over the weather. Do you recognise those words, Tom? You should because you wrote them. That's a quote from your second novel. I wonder if you knew then how true those words were, or if you were just trying them on for size the way some writers do. I suppose it's what literary critics would call style. I'm not a big fan of style myself. I prefer my writers to say what they mean and to mean what they say, but as I think we've established, I'm not your average reader. I remember the night we first met. I don't wear makeup as a rule but I made a special effort that night. Eyeliner, lipstick, a bit of blush. It's not every day a girl gets to meet the man she's admired from afar. I remember the crisp white shirt you wore and the slightly cocky, slightly nervous smile when you walked into the crowded bookshop. I remember thinking that your author's photograph didn't do you justice, that you were far better looking in the flesh. Never did I imagine this would be the start of something life-changing. I'd only come to hear you speak and get my book signed. Contrary to what you may think, I didn't plan for any of what came afterwards. Grand passions really aren't my thing. I'm not one of those women who sits around dreaming of being swept off their feet. I've never needed a man to complete me. Not like my mother. She was never happy unless she had a room full of male admirers, yet never tired of boasting of her feminist credentials. But we both know what hypocrite feminists can be. In fact, that was one of the first things that we agreed on, that night at the bookshop when I stayed behind after the crowds had dwindled. Some woman was complaining about the lack of positive female role models in your books, as if your responsibility as a novelist isn't to tell a good story, but to make her feel validated. I could see you needed rescuing, so I spoke up. That's the trouble with some feminists. What they lack in imagination, they make up for in self-righteousness. You feigned shock. And what kind of feminist are you? The recovering kind, I replied, and you laughed flashing those perfect white teeth of yours. You asked my name. I handed you my business card. Evie, you said. That's a pretty name. I watched you slide the card into your breast pocket. 
Then you took my book and signed it. To Evie, a kindred spirit. Best wishes, Tom Hunter. Imagine me and Tom Hunter, kindred spirits. If only you've known how thrilled I was, but I hid it well. I've always been good at hiding things. That was just the beginning. I'd been following you on Twitter for a year by then, but despite tagging you in several posts that praised your work, you hadn't followed me back. Clearly you had a change of heart that night. Did you check my profile before you went to sleep? Did you lie awake, counting down the hours until you made your next move? Because at 6.12am the next morning, there it was. A notification informing me that you were now following me back on Twitter. I tried not to read too much into it, but I couldn't help myself. 6.12am is a very intimate time to be expressing an interest in someone. Most of us are barely awake at such an early hour. I pictured you lying in bed, wiping the sleep from your eyes, looking at your phone, already thinking of me. It's no wonder my mind was racing. A girl could be forgiven for thinking you had designs on her, and as this girl soon discovered, she wasn't wrong. But let's get back to today. I spotted you long before you saw me. You were climbing out of a black cab. You had the collar of your jacket turned up and a red scarf tied loosely around your neck. You looked good, a little tied around the eyes perhaps, but that's only to be expected. It can't have been easy for you, keeping up appearances all this time. No wonder the strain is showing. I assume that was her with you. Emma Norton, the one I'm obliged to refer to as the other woman. I must say, she looks nothing like her profile picture. She's obviously not a natural blonde, is she? Not like me. Dad says my hair is the colour of honey. The sweetness starts at the top of my head and runs through me like lettuce through a stick of rock. Was Emma the reason you blanked me today, Tom? I won't pretend I wasn't hurt by that. My lawyer said I shouldn't talk to you, but we're both adults. We can still be civil to one another. Just because someone studied law doesn't mean they're always right. I've had injury lawyers cold calling me about car accidents that never even happened. That's how much faith I have in the legal profession. Listening to all the arguments today, I was struck by a number of things. One, what a mess we've made for ourselves. Two, what clever bastards those lawyers are. They twist everything you say, don't they? And three, wouldn't it be easier if we just sorted this out between ourselves? I know we tried once before. That night I waited for you outside your flat. Maybe if you'd asked me in instead of freaking out and calling the police, we could have resolved our differences there and then. We still could. It's not too late. Why make this any harder than it needs to be? I'm willing to forgive and forget if you are. Promise me you'll think about it. Sleep on it and email me in the morning. And if I don't hear from you, at least I'll know where I stand and I'll see you tomorrow in court. Yours, Evie. Thank you. Thank you.